And now it's my honor to uh, introduce our speaker, Dr. Jacobson, our longtime medical advisor who gives an annual update in June on what's going on in the world of research and treatment. Uh, uh, and other times he reports from recently attending the various conferences, uh, professional organization conferences. So Frederick Jacobson, MD, MPH, DLF, APA, and Dr. Jacobson will have to remind me and us of what DLF, APA, uh, Distinguished Something Fellow of the APA. Um, uh, Dr. Frederick Jacobson studied neurobiology and behavior at Cornell University. He got a dual MD and MPH as a James Scholar at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Medical internship and residency in psychiatry at Yale, and then he came to NIMH to uh, study effective illness and sleep, conducted the first studies on serotonin and light, light, light therapy. He's the author of 80, over 80 scientific publications, pioneered treatments for depression, insomnia, memory loss, and migraine, particular interest in bipolar, and the founding medical director of the Trans Cultural Mental Health Institute. He's involved in patient advocacy and cross-cultural public health, including lecturing, consulting, participating in mental health delegations in over 30 countries. By the way, Dr. Jacobson's wife, Dr. Comas Diaz, I believe, uh, I believe is, is also heads that 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 organization. She's spoken to us and made some time again. Uh, Dr. Jacobson is clinical professor of psychiatry, behavioral sciences at the George Washington University School of Medicine, board certified psychiatry, geriatric psychiatry, sleep medicine, behavioral neurology, and neuropsychiatry. Distinguished fellow, I guess that's what the LFAPA is, of the American Psychiatric Association. He's received the Distinguished Psychiatrist Award from NAMI and the National Chapter Professional Advisor Award from DBSA. Uh, he supplements his professional work with photography and the arts. So I have the honor to present for this year's talk, Dr. Frederick Jacobson. So thank you, Alan, for that kind of introduction. I'd also like to thank Eric Sharp for his invaluable technical support, my patients, Dr. Lillian Comas Diaz, and all the others who have persevered under this difficult COVID situation. Uh, information I'm presenting here represents my personal opinions and public health orientation, not necessarily reflecting opinions of other who I'm not affiliated. The presentation does include discussion of research findings uh, from recent meetings and off-label experimental not FDA approved treatments. Now the big story, of course, in the last two years as we all know, it is COVID-19. As of today, this morning, there have been over 600,000 deaths in the US and globally, <clears throat> over 3.8 million. Um, when we take a look at this, this is data from the last 100 years from the Center for Disease Control. You can see this is the current COVID-19 pandemic. Um, going back, this is the highest death rate in the last hundred years in the United States since the great influenza of 1918. Worldwide, COVID deaths in 2021 have already surpassed those in 2020. Quite amazing. And for many people around the world, there is a feeling of dread and anxiety with this. In fact, this is a search from this morning. If you just plug in COVID-19 to the National Library of Medicine, you will find over 145,000 papers published. I mean, that's an incredible amount. When I first did this slide two weeks ago, it was 138,000. So these things are increasing exponentially. And part of this has to do with the impact on people. And part of the impact on people has to do with the people that are actually infected with COVID because COVID has very uh, 
uh, dramatic neuropsychiatric effects. Uh, screen seems to be, let's see here, <clears throat> a majority of people who come down with COVID-19 suffer loss of taste and smell, muscle aches and pains, fatigue, malaise, some develop ischemic strokes, hemorrhages, encephalitis, prolonged unconsciousness, um, and psychosis and delirium. Many also experience what's called post-acute sequelae of cars COVID-2 infection, which is prolonged fatigue, memory impairment, and concentration disorder, which I label a COVID fog headache, pain, insomnia, anxiety, PTSD, and depression, which is, of course, something that people in this organization are all too familiar with. While the current evidence from all these scientific studies does not yet show that uh, COVID-19 directly gets into the brain, there is microvascular disease and inflammation which occurs that goes into the brain from the immune system. <clears throat> Hospitalized individuals who have a history of mood disorder appear at much greater risk for COVID morbidity and mortality and are at increased risk for post-acute care due to the probably this microvascular inflammation. Um, leading to a long-haul COVID, which may actually result in later dementia. One in five patients who have recovered from the previous coronavirus outbreaks, that is SARS in 2002, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome in 2012, reported memory impairment. As survivors of the 1918 influenza pandemic, were found at an increased cognitive decline, psychosis, and Parkinson's disease. A recent scientific study suggested that it's probable that having COVID-19 will increase one's risk of dementia. In fact, one third of COVID-19 survivors developing neuropsychiatric disorder within months of their infection. You can see the timeline here. <clears throat> Anxiety disorders are the most common neuropsychiatric diagnoses among COVID-19 patients occurring in over 17%. Mood disorders occur in nearly 14%. Substance use of COVID leads to people abusing substances in nearly 7% and psychotic disorders occur in a smaller. This is from a study in Lancet just two months ago. But all of us <clears throat> are subject to COVID isolation. <clears throat> this is the former commissioner of the FDA who this past Sunday said that this isolation is probably going to return, paraphrasing him, there's a substantial risk for the COVID-19 Delta variant that one, that's now coming to the United States to spread this fall. And he expects that it could spike a new epidemic this fall in the United States un, with the unvaccinated being at most risk. It's doubling, that is this new Delta variant, is currently doubling every two weeks. It does mean, this is Dr. Gottlieb's words, that it is going to take over. It's currently only about 10% of the COVID infections. Um, it came out of India, but it is much more uh, virulent than the previous ones. Um, Now, adding to our social isolation in this last 15, 16 months have been a number of social phenomena that have put all of us on edge and contributed to the general 
generalized sense of anxiety and for many people, despair. This includes uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, the, the iniquities in our society. Um, it includes the Me Too movement. Um, these kinds of things which are happening on a daily basis are in addition to the millions in the United States and around the world who have lost their jobs and are unemployed to the mass shootings that we hear about practically every week, if not more frequently, and to break-ins from cyber threats um, that are also happening with increasing regularity. Recently, as most of you know, the world's highest paid athlete, Naomi Osaka, a top women's tennis player, withdrew from the French Open due to a combination of depression and social anxiety. She couldn't carry out what uh, was talking to the press, the press being on top of her. And in, in a very real way, I see this while very difficult for her, and very positive for many other people because it brings to the fore the issues of anxiety and depression that are rife within humanity and which have been overlooked. Obviously, that is the purpose of DBSA to try and uh, raise greater awareness of this and give people support. And so I am glad that she took the opportunity to highlight um, what is happening to her. The effects of loneliness and boredom in this social isolation are incredible. And most people that I know personally and in my practice have been impacted in one way or another binge eating, binging on TV, computer games. This new term that most of you have heard of called languishing is really characterizing much of what people have been going through. <clears throat> this binging actually has been associated with a substantial amount of weight gain. This is from an article published in March in the Journal of American Medical Association showing that weight has gone up um, uh, in the U.S. population uh, during COVID. And uh, of course, that weight, as we've talked about in some of our previous meetings, is associated with all kinds of adverse effects. Um, one of the things that this whole series of symptoms that we experience leads to binge eating, staying up late, watching TV or computer games, is languishing, is a disruption of sleep and our circadian physiology. And this, as many of you will recall from our past chats that we've had on a yearly basis, is very important for people with mood disorders because delaying your sleep, not getting enough sleep worsens pretty much all psychiatric illnesses. You can go down the list here from depression, bipolar, anxiety disorders, psychotic addictive disorders, all kinds of findings, but they're generally um, in the direction that uh, staying up too late and not getting enough sleep worsens your brain function. This happens um, with COVID-19 and with people who are subject to this COVID stress uh, through a variety of different physical effects. I'm not going to go through all of these, but these cytokines are inflammatory um, uh, things that are released into the blood um, and they are triggered by poor diet, sedentary behavior, 
psychological stress, and yes, disrupted sleep and circadian rhythms. And these have a direct impact on mood, decreasing mood, increasing depression, and on increasing anxiety. Now, part of the reason for this is that sleep has multiple functions. Perhaps the most important is to clear the garbage out of the blood that, um, and the brain that accumulates during the 24 hour cycle every day with enzymatic transactions. Um, but there are a whole host of things, transfer of information, strengthening new neural connections that cannot occur well when people are not getting sufficient sleep. <clears throat> so a lack of sleep triggers anxiety, and whereas deep sleep, getting sufficient deep sleep, acts as a natural anxiolytic. It reduces anxiety by restoring mechanisms involved in emotional regulation. Poor sleep has also been shown to be highly associated with suicide in both the young, in this study here, and in the elderly, in the study of over 14,000 individuals. Um, this may be due to decreased activity in our frontal lobes and executive function at night versus during the day. In fact, suicide is three times more likely to occur at night compared to any other time of the day. This is a startling slide for me. Just one hour less of weekday sleep is associated with an increase in risk in suicidal ideation and attempts in high school students. So this is an incredibly important uh, factor. Now, I have talked in here many times and I talk with all of my patients about how to try and improve their sleep. And part of it is by accentuating the daytime, setting your biological clock. The use of bright light to set your biological clock um, is extremely well documented and the most powerful cue. It also enhances alertness. Um, and uh, for people who have depression, it has an antidepressant effect, regardless of whether it's a seasonal depression or a non-seasonal depression. And it um, actually increases energy level decreases carbohydrate cravings and can diminish weight gain and can normalize neuroendocrine uh, imbalances. Um, this happens via two different biological mechanisms. One is the enhancement of serotonergic function and the other is by shifting and setting one's biological clock, which is so important. But when we think back to the earlier slides that I showed where people are just staying up and playing on their computers and binging on soap operas and Netflix, then what happens? They are not, they're getting too much light in the evening and that disturbs their sleep. In fact, most indoor light sources produce enough blue-green light to disturb sleep, um, and particularly computers and devices. And so I recommend it to many people in my practice to use blue light blockers, such as these UVEX safety eyewear. These are the ones that are at the top of the list of the many that have been studied. Um, I advise people to use them after 6 or 7 p.m. Um, to help diminish the kind of ambient light that is going to be interfering with their sleep and thereby causing more anxiety and disrupting their mood. Um, in general, these kind of wraparound orange uh, goggles are better because they 
They don't let light in from the edges. And we go again to the National Library of Medicine today and take a look at COVID-19 and mental health specifically. There are practically 9,000 articles that have been written to date um, that link mental health with social resources, physical function, and loneliness at the center, impacting cognitive function, impacting physical health. When we take that a step further, look at the physiology behind it, we wanna not dig too deep, but the inflammation comes up, lack of exercise. And this has bad metabolic effects. It leads to high blood pressure, insulin resistance, age-related cognitive decline. Um, so it's very important to keep these things in mind and setting your biological clock, getting a good night's sleep. When we talk about anxiety and depression during COVID and in general, there's a high comorbidity. In this slide, you can see that anxiety and depression have a big overlap. 50 to 65% of panic disorder patients have depression. 70% of social anxiety disorders have depression. 67%, some studies up to 85% of obsessive compulsive disorder have depression. And then 49% of social anxiety disorder get panic attacks. You can see that there's a lot of overlap and all of this has been heightened by COVID-19 and it's running through our society socially and physiologically. Now, bipolar individuals, such as what this organization is specifically um, taking a look at, tend to have depression. This are classic studies of bipolar individuals who are followed anywhere from 13 to 13 and a half years. And in most people that have either major mood swings or mild mood swings, that uh, they have, tend to have mainly depressive episodes. Um, and those depressive episodes tend to increase over time. When people experience mood swings, oftentimes there is a confusion because people will come in and be extremely anxious. States of very high anxiety particularly when accompanied by depression, which could be called a depressed irritability, um, are often symptomatic of what we call a bipolar mixed state. Um, up to 50% of uh, mixed state episodes may be medication triggered, and the onset of this is typically before age 21 at least 40% of individuals with mood swing, that can be full blown manic depressives or people with milder mood swings will experience these kinds of mixed states with high anxiety. But for people that have the milder mood swings, they, they may very well not be recognizing that it is part of a mood swing illness. And that leads to many being either diagnosed as depressed or diagnosed as anxious and unfortunately medicated for those um, things which can actually worsen the bipolar process. So what are the cues that uh, from someone that comes in depressed that in fact they may have depression that is a mood swing, more of a bipolar depression. Well, the cues include having an early age of onset of mood symptoms. The majority of women who have 
postpartum mood disorders or bipolar, the overwhelming, the overwhelming number of 85% of people who suffer from seasonal mood changes are along the bipolar spectrum. Our studies at NIMH showed that years back. People suffering during depression from oversleeping and feeling slowed down. Um, and of course, a bipolar history is very strongly reflective of uh, the likelihood that rather than major depression or anxiety, someone is actually having a bipolar illness. Now, I wanted to move then into some of the new treatments um, because each year I'm pleased to get a chance to talk um, about those. Um, this actually has to do with COVID. It says the only side effect from my second vaccination was that I slept most of the afternoon, but didn't feel the need to justify. So the way that I think we should look at this is that in every crisis like COVID, therein lies an opportunity. During COVID, the adoption of telemedicine has leaped far ahead of where it would be without the pandemic. And we're hopeful that we will be able to retain the ability to uh, provide telehealth without restrictions. Because in the past, of course, it was very difficult um, for me legally to be able to provide service to someone in a state other than which I was licensed in, but Congress in their wisdom last year removed all of those barriers and they also made reimbursement for telehealth on par with that office visits, which I think was a very wise move. So I think that we as a general public should be very supportive of continuing this, removing these barriers to health. This is where a public health orientation comes in. And that has led to over 60% of US adults being vaccinated. Uh, at, as of today, according to Johns Hopkins, 146 and a half million Americans have gotten the vaccine, which is really good news since that is what is going to help prevent this worsening. Moreover, other good news is that as of last week, the proportion of lab tests testing positive for COVID-19 is now at the lowest rate in the U.S. since the pandemic's onset. Uh, that's quite dramatic. Now, I have to say that this Delta variant that we mentioned before is a little bit scary. I have people I see internationally and was uh, quite shocked when several mentioned uh, in the last couple of weeks that while they and everyone in their extended family had received both vaccines, several of these people that had the dual vaccinations had subsequently come down with COVID. They had gotten infected with this Delta variant. So that's pretty scary. Fortunately, in the cases thus far, it doesn't tend to be so severe in people who have gotten the double vaccination, but um, we have to be on guard and I think wait for the fall when both Pfizer and Moderna will be coming out with booster shots and all of us will need to get those. We also need to approach this COVID isolation and there are new kinds of approaches to this. There is something called a peer companionship that has been launched um, analogous to uh, Meals on Wheels. Um, and some of it is done in the internet. Um, and of course, many people, um, many more than has ever been recorded historically have adopted pets, um, which uh, really is a very important thing for companionship and decreasing the isolation. 
Now, when we talk about treatment, particularly treatment for depression, and many of the antidepressants that we have available in this country are problematic. And that's because they're fairly low remission rates, um, not too much higher than placebo, a lot of recent controlled trials, and they have questionable efficacy in bipolar depression. Um, they don't really tend to have very good effects on comorbid medical illnesses. Um, and there's a, a great lag in their onset time. But one thing I thought would be really important to talk with you about tonight, and this is getting on my public health soapbox, is that the U.S. is sort of alone in this because abroad there are numerous effective antidepressants and other psychotropics that are available that people can respond to, but that are not available in the United States. Uh, this is a timeline uh, which uh, starts at the very beginning of psychotropics uh, with the opiates and chloral hydrate. Uh, barbital, but then goes up with amphetamines in 1925, the invention, the first uh, antipsychotic chlorpromazine was in the 50s, and then the first um, uh, antidepressants were invented in the 50s as well. But you can see here, I put in two antidepressants that most of you will never have heard of. One is called meclobamide which came out in 1972, and the other um, uh, was Tyaneptine, which came out in 1999. Now, meclobamide, uh, most of you have heard of monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Meclobamide is one of several reversible MAOIs. People tend to shy away from MAOIs because you can have this cheese reaction and have a spike in your blood pressure. Uh, the MAOIs may be actually better in terms of treatment of uh, bipolar illness, less likely to trigger episodes, and they're um, excellent for all different kinds of anxiety and for treatment of migraines. But this meclobamide is, uh, and the other uh, reversibles are not available in this, uh, in this country. Um, and people have the misconception that the side effects are similar to those of Parnate and Nardel, but really they're, they're much more benign. Um, meclobamide has a relatively fast onset of action um, compared with other antidepressant classes, good long-term tolerability, don't develop tolerance to it. Um, and as was seen in this study versus uh, the previous gold standard, amipramine didn't seem to be likely to uh, trigger mood swings. Um, but it's not available in the United States. It's available in Canada. It's available in Mexico. It's available throughout Latin America. It's available throughout Europe, throughout Asia, Africa, as is Tyaneptine, which goes by a number of different trade names. Uh, interestingly enough, Tyaneptine uh, throws the boat over. If you think about the most prescribed class of antidepressants, those are the serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Prozac and Zoloft and that kind of thing. Well, this does just the opposite of that. Tyaneptine is a serotonin enhancer and it is both antidepressant and reduces anxiety. It has few sedative, anticholinergic, or cardiovascular side effects. It also has some interesting effects on uh, the opiate uh, receptors and on the glutamate receptors, and it uh, releases this brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which um, enhances uh, neural plasticity improving brain function over time. So you ask, well, why aren't these and many of these other medications 
that are effective available in the United States. Many effective medications are not available in the United States that are widely so abroad, including Canada, and often sold, by the way, at a fraction of the cost in the US. Um, why is that? Well, these restrictions um, for access in the United States are really based on a couple of factors. One is the extraordinarily expensive cost of a drug getting approved uh, in the United States. It's uh, over, well over a billion dollars. And the second, frankly, is big pharma blocking entry of competing non-FDA approved medications. So what that leads to, and perhaps most importantly, is in the US we have, as you know, an adversarial legal system. And this is designed to prevent consumers such as yourself from accessing non-FDA approved medication. Consumers who purchase or take non-FDA approved medications may actually disqualify their health insurance coverage, not just for depression or anxiety, but for all health conditions. Similarly, physicians who go so far as to try and prescribe these foreign sourced non-FDA approved meds for their patients' benefits actually invalidate their own professional insurance coverage and likely are in violation of their medical licenses. So this is a huge problem. And I would submit to you that as a patient advocacy organization, we should think about seeing what we can do to try and reverse this. And I'm going to have a little bit more to say about this in just a minute. Let me segue first into another related item. There is a supplement called N-acetylcysteine. Many of you know it, some take it, which is a natural chemical in the central nervous system. It's been available for years as an over-the-counter supplement. It's extremely useful. I prescribe it for probably several hundred people. It, it helps treat obsessional behaviors, addictive behaviors. It actually helps treat bipolar depression and mood stabilization. It actually even helps with negative symptoms, schizophrenia and PTSD. And its side effects in Control studies generally do not exceed that of placebo. However, Amazon.com recently halted sale of NAC since some individuals have lobbied the FDA to get NAC, which has long been available as a supplement, cheap, reclassified as a prescription medication. Now, we know that there are these vulture small private companies that have gone in and purchased rights to things like the EpiPen, certain forms of insulin and different things, and then jacked up the price often by hundreds fold. And this is what I believe is happening with NAC. Reclassifying it would be, I believe, a tremendous disservice to large groups of individuals who are already health disadvantaged. Um, and I think we need, and perhaps the BSA should think about this, petitioning the FDA. This is an important act to save an important psychotropic. And by the way, it's happened before in the late um, 1980s. Wellbutrin, some of you may know, was actually taken off of the US market for three years because of a concern about toxicity. It's, it's a story we can talk about, but it, it wasn't really so toxic um, at all. But the way it got back is there were actually, I was part of a group of 30 psychopharmacologists nationwide who actually had it 
in our practices as part of a study during those three years while it was off the market. And the study was to determine whether in fact it did have very toxic effects. And when it was determined it didn't, then there was a groundswell of petition from DBSA, from NAMI, from hundreds of thousands of individuals across the country who had responded well to this antidepressant and then crashed when it was removed. And the FDA took a look at the data and let the drug be reinstated. So I think this is an important lesson for us. In the real world, the practice of science is both social and political. So disagreement and confusion and controversy occur frequently. Another example of this, I think, is the recent, you probably heard last week, approval of this new medication for Alzheimer's disease, aducanumab. It's the first medication that's been successful at removing amyloid beta from brain cells, which is the thing that accumulates and clogs up the brain. You can see on uh, the amyloid PET scans here how the Alzheimer's brain becomes clogged. Now, while this is very encouraging to people and their families facing Alzheimer's disease, the data for this approval are pretty lacking. In fact, um, the FDA advisory committee um, had actually recommended that aducanumab not be approved for lack of evidence of effectiveness. And last week, the third member of that advisory committee, the director of Harvard's program on regulation, therapeutics and law wrote that it was probably the worst drug approval decision in recent US history. This was a uh, thing from, I guess, two weeks ago uh, uh, from JAMA. Um, Moreover, the drug is, of course, not cheap. It costs 56000 a year if it uh, is going to be prescribed. And with a lack of evidence of effectiveness, I'm not sure that the insurance companies are really going to go for. But let's go back to the standard kind of antidepressants and talk about what those do. We know that from previous lectures, you've heard me talk about usually the MAOIs, the tricyclics, the SSRIs target what are called the biogenic amines, the do dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin. Um, however, these have problems. They require daily administration. Remission rates are relatively low. Uh, any troubling side effects. Uh, they take a long time to start working. Um, there are, however, some new antidepressants that have just been approved. One is called Libalvi. Uh, it's indicated for uh, bipolar one disorder and acute manic or mixed episodes and schizophrenia in adults. Now, this is as a mood stabilizer. However, when I saw this approval, which just happened uh, quite recently, I took a step back because it follows the trend which uh, Dr. Nirenberg, when he spoke to this group uh, over the winter, pointed out in uh, a study of his um, that more antipsychotics are being prescribed and fewer mood stabilizers over time. And this is the case even though lithium prescription is declining and lithium is the only medication which has ever been shown to prevent suicide. And moreover, these antipsychotics that are being prescribed rather than mood stabilizers can have as I mentioned in this paper in 2015, potential irreversible neurological and cognitive effects, which patients are often not told of. So why is this happening? Uh, once again, there's a lot more money to be made from Me Too antipsychotics than from an expensive natural element like lithium. Uh, parenthetically, lithium may actually protect against Alzheimer's disease. There are a number of 
studies that have found that. Another thing that was approved just recently, at the beginning of April, is uh, a treatment for ADD in children, but I'm putting it up here for you folks because this veloxazine or Kelbury um, has a number of different neurotransmitter effects um, that uh, suggest the possibility that it may have antidepressant effects as well, even though for the time being, it is just classified as an ADD treatment for children. So we're starting to think about things from a broader perspective and that when we move just beyond the biogenic means and start considering the whole hormonal system, the neuroendocrine system with thyroid and estrogen, testosterone, go on, the steroids, there, one path in particular recently has uh, been highlighted, which is quite interesting that I thought I would bring up for you, which is the pathway of cholesterol to uh, a chemical allopregnanolone. You may um, be aware that neurosteroids play a major role in mood disorders. Um, and in both their vulnerability and their expression. Well, this allopregnanolone um, is uh, two years ago uh, was released as a specific treatment for postpartum depression. And a, a single infusion of this um, actually treats postpartum depression for 30 days. And in one of the meetings, um, data just recently was presented showing that the new oral form of this drug, Rexamalone, which is not yet released and not yet um, submitted or not yet through approval, um, to the FDA, but this oral form of this actually um, has very dramatic antidepressant effects in major depression. And that, that may bode well for the future. Now, what are some of the other things that are being taken a look at now? One are the hallucinogens. Um, now, we all know that historically, individuals with a personal or family history of mania or any psychotic illness are advised strongly avoid, to avoid hallucinogens um, because of the fear of psychosis. Um, there are three major classes of uh, serotonergic hallucinogens that uh, you're familiar with. The psilocybin mushrooms, the ergot fungus, and of course, mescaline. Um, you probably heard in the media that recently um, there has been a trial showing a very dramatic antidepressant effect in psilocybin um, compared with placebo. So this is uh, opening a new front of a new kind of treatment for depression. Now the scale that was used um, in this was uh, different, a little bit different, and this was in the New England Journal earlier this year, was I, I find it interesting as a little bit different than your typical depression rating scale um, because it included things uh, like uh, feeling close to other people and feeling confidence that uh, I'd never heard of it before, actually. It's called the Warwick Edinburgh Mental, but it, it's, it's a more global well-being scale, and I, I think that merits uh, taking a look at. Another very exciting finding, um, which uh, just was published, was an update on something I presented in here a couple of years ago, um, uh, came out of the VA system, which is that nitrous oxide, um, laughing gas, actually is an effective treatment um, for uh, treatment-resistant depression. This is an article that was published June 9th um, uh, showing uh, 
quite dramatically that a single one hour inhalation of nitrous at either 50 or 25% concentration provided rapid antidepressant efficacy in patients with severe treatment resistant major. These were people, many of whom had not responded to ECT and to all kinds of things. These antidepressant effects increased in magnitude over time. I mean, that's quite remarkable, lasting up to four weeks in some patients, three months from study initiation at completion, 85% of patients had improved, 55% had a treatment response, 40% were in remission. This is quite dramatic. And I think laughing gas nitrous is going to be in our future armamentarium very soon. But one of the things that I stress to all of the people I see is that activity is critical to treat depression and anxiety and to facilitate sleep. And it's even better as this slide from Europe shows, if you can get outside and do the activity, get outside and walk. If you can walk among trees, even better. So when we go back and we think about putting COVID that we're suffering through now in perspective, I think it's sort of good news. If we contrast it with that Spanish flu from 100 years ago, our deaths then in the Spanish flu are about less, a little bit less than 600, not, not that different from COVID. However, worldwide, the Spanish flu killed 50 to 100 million people. Think about that. There have only been less than 4 million killed from COVID. So we're talking about different orders of magnitude here. Unfortunately, I, I believe that you know, COVID is not going to be the last. I think we may suffer worse in the future uh, epidemics, pandemics, but we hopefully will be better organized. So I want to leave you today with some general takes for health maintenance that derive from some of the points I've made during this talk. First is taking bright light immediately upon waking will help to set your biological clock, um, set your sleep-wake cycle, reinforce this clock stability, Using the blue light glasses in the evening, blue light blocking glasses helps. If you're going to particularly be watching any screens as all of us do, melatonin, which I didn't talk about now, but have in the past, and I know probably majority of you take anyway, if you take it correctly, it reinforces sleep and your biological clock. And you should avoid the internet and video games after 9 p.m., bedroom is for sleep and sex only. You should avoid uncomfortable sleeping environments and binging after dinner. Um, and of course, recreational drugs, alcohol and cigarettes. So I'm going to close with that. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Jacobson. Uh, it was very, very helpful. Um, appreciate your uh, your sharing. Um, um, if people have, I didn't see any in the chat box yet, so uh, please uh, drop questions in the chat box. Um, um, if you have questions, we have about 10 more minutes. So, uh, um, um, uh, apparently disabled, I apologize. I thought we had that, that disabled uh, or, or enabled. So, well, um, I, I, I want to comment your, your uh, observations about the um, uh, NAC uh, were well taken. I will share that with the leadership at uh, DBSA. Um, we are traditionally somewhat reluctant to speak out on specific medications. Um, so um, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, we'll, we'll have to run that by our scientific advisory uh, committee to see how they want to handle that. But I will raise that with them. So. Um, um, Okay, well, well, I'm seeing lots of thank yous and comments, uh, uh, but not yet any questions. Uh, so let's, let's well, that's, that's, that's fine. That's, that's fine. Yeah.
Okay, I'm, okay. I'm yep. happy to um, resume in person, okay. hopefully next year, so we can see the audience. Uh -huh. feel. Exactly, exactly. Uh -huh. So yeah. There was a question uh, about the proper way to take melatonin. Uh, melo yeah, melatonin. And, okay, uh, so actually the proper way to take melatonin is twofold. Al Louie, when he was at NIH, uh, 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 and subsequent to that, um, is a really pioneer in this research. And um, for best synchronization of your biological clock, you need to take about a half a milligram of melatonin, preferably sublingually, um, approximately five hours before your hope for bedtime. Then in addition, you may take anywhere uh, of a larger dose from two to five milligrams, uh, oh, no. much closer no, 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 no. to that time. And that is likely to uh, facilitate um, the somnolence no, 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 during no, no. that. But it's actually that much earlier dose and smaller dose that is responsible for setting the hands of the clock. Very good. Someone asked what the sublingually means? Oh, under the tongue, okay. yes, it's, uh, okay. they do that. Mm -hmm. it, it's, and that's because it's very rapidly absorbed mm -hmm. into the bloodstream. Gotcha. You, can you say something about ketamine um, and, and, the, and the bravado and those sorts of things? Uh, yes, um, I actually have some slides on that. I don't know whether we want to go back onto the slides. Um, uh, yeah, we probably probably not. Uh, not probably at this point, we're a little so short of time. Yeah. The ketamine, um, this bravado, uh, does seem to be an effective treatment. Um, uh, it, uh, how long the effectiveness lasts is still uh, in question. That is to say, you need to. It's an intranasal formulation. I talked about it two years ago. Um, I uh, am registered to uh, give this spravato, but have not done so to any of my patients because you really have to have a uh, clinical setup with a nurse or some personnel being able to monitor uh, the individual for three hours after mm. you've had this intranasal dose of it because upwards of 80% of people that take it get a dissociative sort of psychotic reaction. Um, and so uh, I think it's a step in the right direction targeting uh, a new chemical system. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been where it is proving the most optimal is yeah. in the emergency rooms, given uh, acutely to people who are suicidal, it immediately, almost immediately, gets rid of their suicidality. And that's quite remarkable. Right. Time for probably one more question. A uh, question about whether doctors would be providing hallucinogenics or nitrous oxides in their office. Um, um, and also, does la laughing gas change the chemistry of the brain, and, and is it permanent? Uh, uh, no, it doesn't change the uh, chemistry of the brain permanently. Um, it has to be, at this point, um, uh, it has to be given with an anesthesiologist present, because it is an anesthetic. Uh, there are, given these findings that I showed you today, there are... Uh, a number of companies, of course, that Throws it up there, it's a bit. looking for look, looking to try and develop a product oh, yes. that uh, could be taken at home, um, uh, because uh, of course, right now it's in sort of the same ballpark as ketamine. You have to have a person under constant monitoring with blood pressure and all that kind of stuff, even though bad reactions to nitrous oxide are, are quite rare. But I will predict that within the not too distant future, we're going to have a, a, a much more easily accessible version of this since its effects are clearly dramatic 
um, interactive effects are uh, very minimal. And uh, so I, I think it's a very positive thing on the horizon. Thank you, thank you. We we do need to wrap up. I'm going to ask Alvin to uh, to wrap us up here. Uh, okay, so I have the honor of doing that. I see one question in the chat was: Will send, send, someone send us a link to the entire session? Look to the yes. weekly email that goes out, you know, either the one this weekend or the following weekend, and the link will be coming in there to follow up on this. So, I I thank Dr. Jacobson. I certainly learned a lot. Uh, I serve on um, a National DBSA Advisory Council. They want to have chapter representatives giving feedback to the national leadership on what's going on. So I will raise some of these questions about medication availability with them, and I'll check their response as well. As, as Eric, I learned a lot. Uh, I noted the problem with renewing NAC. Um, so we always learn a lot, learned information we didn't know. I may follow up with Dr. Jacobson asking about speakers um, we, we might have um, on some of the topics um, uh, mentioned tonight. So as always, of course, thank Dr. Jacobson for his talks, for his service, his involvement in our chapter over the past 36 years. And I trust uh, continuing into the future. Um, and I look forward to doing this again, preferably in person. But this gave us a chance to be, have the clock open to people from all around the country. And I think we've had people from from various places. So, uh, you know, this pandemic has both its advantages and disadvantages. But thank you, Dr. Jacobson, for all you do. And we look forward uh, to future programs. Well, thank you all for attending and keep healthy. Oh, by the way, the national conference, the national DBSA summit is going to be virtual October, September 27th, October 1st. I think it's got a low registration cost. It's now available online. Registration is now open online. Um, people may want to participate. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. And, and Thank yes, you, uh, let me add my thank you. Uh, I also, I just put the uh, uh, opening slide deck uh, with the announcements in the uh, chat box. So um, um, please uh, take a look at that. We will share the questions with uh, the people put in the chat box that we didn't get to and see if Dr. Jacobson can maybe respond to them and we can post them uh, in the uh, newsletter or something this week. So I know some people were disappointed that we didn't get to all the questions, but unfortunately we have a, a DBSA uh, support group meeting about to start. So. Um, okay. Please uh, feel free to join us for that. All right. Thank you, everyone, and uh, good evening. Thank you. Take care.